Hey everybody, it's Rajesh here. And Tane here. Welcome to our podcast, Baskets of Knowledge, Chats with a Difference. In our podcast, we invite guests from around the country and around the world to talk about how they got to where they are at the moment. It's about a journey, it's about an experience, it's about their life. Kia ora koutou everybody, welcome to another episode of Baskets of Knowledge. Um, for those of you that are regular listeners, welcome back. For those of you that are new, welcome. Hopefully you enjoyed today's session. For those of you that have been listening to us for a very long time, you know that we scour the country, we scour the world to bring people on that we think are amazing. Everyone is amazing, everyone's got a story to tell. But as you know, we don't get funded for this year. This is pure passion. Um, so we try and invite one person a week that we think is fantastic. Um, this week it's just me. Um, Tane is away doing some pretty cool things in Omaru. Um, oh, well, that's what he tells me. No, who knows what he's doing. Um, so we're not going to have him on today. But um, before we get started, as always, I'd like to share something I've learned in this week here. And um, for me, this week, what I've been learning about is um, change is part of life. I'm going through lots of change in my world, and um, there's a lot of emotions attached to that there as I start doing a bit of change. But it's really um, powerful as you step back and think about what you've done over the years um, as people start reflecting back the things that you have done for them. And sometimes we're so so busy going and going with things that we forget to stop and think about what have we done and the impact that it's having, both positive and negative. And sometimes, and this is what I found really, really hard this week, is when people actually compliment you. And I'm just, I don't know what to say to them. Like, oh, this is great. I'm like, oh, and that's very embarrassing for me. Um, and I think this is something that we all face that it's really hard for us to accept um, compliments or thanks. Um, yeah, it's human nature. I don't know why, but it's something that I'm trying to get through over the next few days. So um, if anyone's got any tips on how to get over that there, let me know because I'm struggling to do that there. Um, so that's my little um, crowd for help there. But maybe our guest today might help with that there. So enough about me. Um, I'm really honored and privileged to welcome our guest on today. Um, as I was speaking to her just before we jumped on the podcast, um, I was explaining um, why I think and why I'm a fan of her work. Um, I have just recently discovered her work, and when I did a bit of research, I was like, wow, this is really, really um, important stuff, but not just for New Zealand, but also across the world with the way the world is going at the moment, um, which is why it'll be, I thought it would be great for her to jump on. But also, as I said to our guest just before, there's a connection that I have with her, which um, I revealed to her when I spoke to her at the start. But we'll find all about that in today's conversation. Um, Welcome and thank you and kia ora to Zoe. Thank you for coming to our podcast today. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm very excited that you have, to have been brought on. I'm very excited to see where today's conversation takes us. Well, that's beautiful, Zoe. So for people who know nothing about you, um, who is Zoe and what is Zoe, Zoe doing at this point in her life? That's always a very tricky question because I think there's lots of details and like, how much do people want to know? Yeah. Um, probably the key things about me. My name is Zoe Zapasi. I am 18 years old. I'm a student at Victoria University of Wellington. Um, I'm currently studying health promotion and this one's a bit longer, but it's all one major. Population health policy and service delivery as my second major. Um, so I'm really enjoying that, really loving what I'm studying just now. Um, I live with my parents, Faith and Upenyu, and my sister and brother, Victoria, and Michael. I always forget Michael. Um, and they poor are... Poor Michael. Yeah, yeah, poor Michael, though. He's he's like my little baby, but he spends a lot of time watching TV in his little room, so sometimes you just don't see him. Yeah, um, Michael. That's yeah I mostly spend a lot of time with my sister now because we our rooms are just parallel to each other um so my sister Victoria is 15 she's turning 16 in like five days and she won't let anyone forget it um and my younger brother Michael is nine. Oh, beautiful that's a great great um, insight into your little um, fauna there um Zoe but Zoe as we start as I said to our listeners just before we have a connection and the connection is not just LinkedIn. The connection comes from the fact that we both come from the same country, which is um, which is Zimbabwe. Let's talk about that there. So um, you grew up in Zimbabwe. And what is that like for you as a young person? And how old were you before you moved to New Zealand? And, and does the impact of you growing up in Zimbabwe, was that really formative at that time? It was very different when I was there. Or was it still, you were so young that you didn't realize that what was happening was pretty surreal, I guess, is the word I'll use. Um, I was actually 18 months when I came to New Zealand. So I don't know that I was actually Nothing. sentient. Exactly. There we go. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> there was yeah. any real memories there. Yeah, totally. There we go. Um, Boom. Yeah. But I think, yeah, growing up, there was always a very strong sense of being different to the people that were around you. Um, I like 
went to kindergarten in New Zealand and those are probably my earliest memories were of either being in kindergarten I think probably as far back as my memory serves is around three or four so it's like at least a, yeah a year and a half after I left Zimbabwe um so I don't have very strong distinctive memories of being in Zimbabwe but I do have a very strong memory of the Zimbabwean diaspora community in New Zealand and that is a community that I'm still in touch with today um so I think I actually wrote an essay about this ages ago about sort of how in my head there's sort of the imagined notion of what Zimbabwe is like without a real tangible understanding of what actually it is. Um, and that's obviously communicated through the people that you know that are from Zimbabwe and the news that you receive from Zimbabwe. But I don't have a very strong connection to, I guess, my own being in Zimbabwe pre being in New Zealand without that reference point of what I think life is and then what life is there. Yeah, totally. And, and I like that. And I like that because that's a preframe to our question later on. And we'll come back to that there. And I think it's beautiful because um, it's acknowledging the fact that, hey, you are you were born in Zimbabwe, but your formative roots were actually here in, here in New Zealand. But on saying that there as well, you're now straddling, like many people in New Zealand, we have a, such a crazy immigrant culture, which is fantastic. You're straddling the world of being being in New Zealand, but not being from New Zealand, if that if that makes sense. And how, how have you navigated that because as you said just before at some point you felt a little bit of a difference and why why that's important is because that is something that you've really pushed in as you've gone as you started become I mean, a bit of an advocate in, in the space that you're in um I think for me that sense of not so much belonging was less so I think I'm intrinsically a very trusting and settled person and I think I've always very much believed that oh I belong because I live in Johnsonville in Wellington so I've always sort of believed like oh I belong in Johnsonville I live in Johnsonville I'm from Johnsonville if anybody asks that that sort of notion of not belonging was more so put on to me by other people um, and I think less so much than I understand like why I don't belong I've just sort of learned to mitigate those interactions where people would then come and approach me at an angle which it, like they're like oh but you don't belong I just kind of skirt around that um so I think in my life that notion of unbelonging has always been less something that I feel personally within myself I very strongly feel quite settled in the place that I am and where I am and I'm Zoe from Johnsonville <laughs> and there was a period where I lived in Wainui so I was Zoe from Wainui um but I've always been very settled in that this is who I am and it's more so this survival thing of that. I know that other people don't see me as this, though. Yeah. And I love that because, you know, we identify with ourselves where we are, but it's the perceptions of others that sometimes affect, rightly or wrongly, how we feel about ourselves. Even though we're so strong, there's there'll be a comment or there'll be something happened that you go, wait a minute, do I belong here? Um, just a question, you know. It's like, it's, I always think about this. It's like when you're walking, when you go to the airport and you go into the security, you know you've got nothing, nothing. There's nothing on you. But you go, you always feel afraid that, oh, what if I've got something on me even though you've got nothing? And, you know, it's it's a sense of the environment you're in that just causes that weird feeling. And I, and I touched on that because you had a fantastic speech at um, TEDx Paparangi a few years ago. And when you spoke about your your initial story was what, made me think about that that you know when you you won the fruit best and then some comment out there just made you feel like that overwhelming guilt but before we talk about that there what was your inspiration be, be behind you actually going up there and giving that fantastic talk fantastic talk um i think definitely my mother i've always been i think particularly in that stage of my life between probably the ages of 13 to 16 was definitely first of all the first time I really encountered real head-on racism but also I guess there's sort of the natural things of that age where you're like oh who am I la 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 so I think I've always been at that stage of my life I was particularly quite insecure and I would always I think it was actually for a UN youth event that I wanted to apply for and I was like oh the the dates I've gone outside the dates my mom was like well why wouldn't you apply what are they going to say like the worst thing they're going to say is no and you can apply again next time and so I applied for that and I got in and that led to a really amazing pathway for me through the UN Youth Organization. And so for my TED Talk, it was one of those things I saw and I was like, oh, I'll sign up, why not? And I kept putting it off and putting it off. And then I think it got to almost the point where the applications were going to close. And I just sort of felt very strongly, well, why not? Why, why wouldn't I sign up? At the end of the day, if I don't get it, I didn't get it. And that's, that's that. But if I do get it, it could be a really good opportunity to do something. In terms of my actual talk topic, 
in my interview, when we sort of sat down, I did it during my lunch break at work. So it was very impromptu as most Zoe things kind of go. Um, and I remember distinctly sort of saying like, oh, I don't really think I want to do a talk on racism just because I feel like, you know, everyone always wants, you know, the black kid to do the talk on racism. And I think I briefly mentioned that like, oh, if I did have to do a talk on racism, I would talk about sort of those expectations that you have to be really exceptional because you are so different and you sort of have to earn your place there in a way that your peers don't have to. Then I think I went on and talked about lots of other random things. And then I, being a bit slack as I can be, I don't think I actually submitted in an alternative topic. And then one day I just saw it popped up, <laughs> the title of my TED talk somewhere. And I was like, oh, I guess I am giving a talk on racism. And then I wrote my speech to follow what I had sort of mentioned in that interview process. And what is that like for you? Because as you said before, you you didn't want to, I mean, you you didn't want to really talk about that, but now that some, someone basically voluntold you that this is your topic, but well, that means you've got to now internally reflect about that. Then what is that journey like for you? Because the reason I ask that question is because, you know, a lot of us, like at the start, we don't stop and reflect. We think about the world, da 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 But when you stop and have to actually write something down to talk, everything changes for you or starts changing for you. Um, thinking back to that process of writing, I think there was never any, at any which point that I sat down and I wrote everything. The writing process was kind of like, I would write a little bit on my phone, it, like in a random sporadic when something came to me, I'd write something quickly then, or I would sit down or particularly when I had deadlines, I would suddenly have all these amazing ideas of things that I wanted to talk about. But I think in terms of that reflecting process, I think a lot of those experiences were very raw at the time. Um, and I think it felt easier to draw upon them just because it felt so present in my life at that time. Um, but I think also the time that that talk came out was kind of me coming over the other end of that experience. Because a lot of those experiences I spoke about in my TED talk were very concentrated, sort of 9 and 10, like 13 to 15. And being 16 at that time of my talk and in year and year 11, you're kind of, you're mixed into new classes, you're meeting new people. And it sort of was like a cool off period at the end of what had, looking back, had been quite a traumatic and intense time in my life. And sort of getting to that sort of cool off break, it was being able to think, oh, that happened. And then that happened in succession. And then that happened in succession. And I'm sort of acknowledging that those things did happen to me and that, I think at the time, like you never think you're particularly young. I always talk at like 18 about like how I'm like, oh, I feel so crickety and old. <laughs> um, but you never think that you're young until you're like retrospectively looking back on it. And I think a lot of that writing process for me was realizing I was also a kid in those scenarios. Um, and I think I had always been in a very active sort of consultation process with the adults around me in terms of dealing with that racism. Um, and it was always, even like at 13, 14, it was always at the perspective of like, I can explain to these other kids why this is bad and why they shouldn't say that to me, why they shouldn't call me those names. But I also shouldn't have to because I'm a kid. And I think that was, even the act of writing that TED Talk was sort of really reasserting. It's like, I am a kid. Like there are all these terrible things that happen in the world and there are some things that have happened to me. But it's like, okay, I'm a kid. And this is me sort of pushing it off. And sort of, I think less so much reclaiming my like independence and strength but I was saying I don't I don't have to be strong <laughs> and this is this is what's happened this is what I've experienced and this is me putting it out there and sort of forgiving myself and sort of acknowledging for the first time I think in my life that there are all these awful things that happened to you and you were a kid and they shouldn't have happened to you and they did and that's what's happened and this is what you can sort of make out of it what i love about that is the fact that you mentioned you know we all go through stages of life you know and in that particular moment whatever stage it is in life that is the most important thing for you at that point in time and what i i, I love this quote that i've heard somewhere where the hardest thing that's happened to you is the hardest things happened to you and i reflect about that because at that point in time when you were 13 14 15 that was the hardest thing that happened to you at that point in time and you reflect on that day, but now that you're 18 and you go 19, 20, you go, wait a minute, things are going to be different, but it doesn't mean they were bad. They were, it was just different and your perspective will change as you grow. But also, also what's important though, is it's important that you put yourself out there because, you know, we all go through experiences. And um, as you said, when you share the story out there of what, what happened in your world or the world that you see as a, as a young person, 
people look at because you know we all talk about empathy empathy is great but none of us can have empathy unless we actually hear a story you know it's when people say oh put yourself in someone else's shoes but that doesn't actually work i can't put myself in your shoes because i have no idea what your story is but when you share your story then i can empathize until that point in time i can just say the word oh empathize with you but what does it actually mean it actually means nothing so that was really really powerful i guess for you and what is that like for you after you did it you know because you know ted ted talks are fantastic but there's also an emotional journey that goes to that um not about the actual talk but getting involved and all these people that have this expectation of the talk and you know you have your friends and your peers that are involved in what is it like after and also your family who you obviously you're very close to what is that like for them seeing you up there doing your and being a becoming a becoming a youtube star as well it's essentially now you're on youtube right yeah it was on youtube i actually generally like i think up until probably this month or so i avoided my ted talk and it was probably the most mortifying thing when someone would tell me like oh wait you're zoe i've seen your ted talk or if someone would yeah. introduce me to someone else and be like oh she she give a ted talk and they'd watch it um it was only recently until a good friend of mine told me that they watched it and that they showed their parents and then i was like oh maybe i will watch my ted talk back and i look back on that once like I think I was far enough from it that yeah. I actually didn't remember what I really spoke about in my TED talk and watching it back I was like oh this is actually quite good um, I think you sort of naturally I think it's a combination of tall poppy but also I think it's when you know that you're good at things you have a higher standard that you hold yourself to that even I I don't know when they cut off the TED talk but I remember I like was standing up there's very odd because there's lights coming down on you so you can't see anyone in the audience and one thing that some people have pointed out to me is that nobody really made any noise. Like nobody laughed or clapped throughout the TED talk. It was very much like I just spoke. Then there was a pause at the end. And so being up there, it was very odd because you're just kind of talking to darkness and you don't really hear anything. And so, and I do a lot of speaking. I teach speech and drama and I've done speech and drama most of my uh, teenage years and so when I learn a speech I just know it so I was just kind of reciting this speech that I learned and then I remember pivoting off and thinking well not my best work <laughs> that was the first thing I thought as soon as I was done I was like oh yeah that was all right um, and so I think it took me a while of I guess obviously coming out of having done it and being like oh this was not the best thing I've ever done in my life and then sort of going through some other things and experiencing more things to be able to look back on it and be like, no, this was actually really good. And I am very proud of myself. Um, my friends and family were obviously very proud of me. A lot of my family did show up. Um, so that was a really great experience. Um, but yeah, for I think for a lot of my life, my TED Talk has always just been something that people tell me about. And I didn't have very strong memories of it. I was like, yeah, it was something I did, but I never really remembered it. Because I guess being... I never saw it when it initially came out. So it was just sort of that pr initial presentation. And then it was just like, oh, everyone tells you about it. And they tell you it was good, but you're not really sure. But um, my family and friends were always just, like, very proud of me. Um, and it, I think, yeah, it was a big thing in my life at the time. It wasn't something I brought up to many people. I think quite a few people, even several months afterwards, were like, what do you mean you gave a TED talk? <laughs> and I was like, no, I did. Uh, it's on YouTube. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah. I think being able to look back on it, sort of 360. Oh yeah, I was very impressed by the work that I did. And and, and so you should be. I mean, um, we'll put the link in the in the show notes as well, so we can actually see. I, I I've watched it a few times actually before I, because it was just very powerful. Lots of things that you said there for a young person. Forget about the fact that you're if you're an adult, just the fact that the way it's articulated is really really beautiful. Um, but again, that was just one phase of your life. You know, that was that was the start of where I'm, I'm going to use it as the start of you. And obviously, there's lots of things that happened for you. But since then, you've gone and done some other interesting things in, in the space here. Um, and one thing I want to focus on right now is um, your work with Create Happy Media. So we've had Lola Fisher on here a few, well, late last year. And she's created, she's created this amazing Create Happy Media, beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, how have you... When you saw that pop up, how did you get involved in it? And what have you seen as the, I remember what uh, what Lola said on our podcast. She goes, it's never too young to start anything. And it's really cool to see that happening. How, is, how have you found being part of that um, community of young people that are creating content for young people by young people? Um, I think obviously with most things, there's sort of that initial experience of feeling quite intimidated, especially I think being in circles that are very partic like particularly politically act active and you're around lots of youth, p 
pe- like youth activists, youth journalists, people that are writing like Nate Wilborn. I think it's very, obviously I think, oh yeah, as a 30 year old looking at Nate Wilborn, you're like, wow, he's doing so much. But like as someone in a pretty close age bracket to Nate Wilborn, I think it's can feel very in- intimidating because everything is so tangibly accessible that like, oh, you could be doing what this person is doing, but you're not. And um, I think being just a little bit older than Lola and Nate and a lot of the other amazing young people doing great stuff, I think you can sort of feel like, oh, maybe I started too late. Um, Or maybe like you feel like probably you're not doing as much as you could be doing. Um, But I think that was one of when I met everyone, because I sort of I knew Lola and I'd met Lola and I'd met Cassie. Um, through a lot of you and youth things but I'd never actually interacted with the bulk of the people writing for Create Happy Media it actually took meeting everybody at Festival for the Future this past year to sort of be like oh people really they aren't very scary they there are 15 16 year olds like they're not as scary as you sort of build them up to be in your head um it's a lovely team of beautiful people that work incredibly hard they're some of the hardest working people that I know um I think getting to be a part of a collective that act like pushes forward so much um but is also simultaneously just lovely cool people to know and to hang out with I think it's something that you don't get very often I think particularly being a young person um even the opportunities that you sort of get to engage with throughout high school and being a young person there's always someone sort of like significantly older to you that you directly look up to and there's obligations that you have and there's a very clear structure of how things are supposed to go but I think having the by youth for youth but also the way that it's run it's very much you have a very active role in the design of how things work and the experience that you have as a contributor as a writer um, I've recently just been promoted to assistant editor I have my first meeting with my team tomorrow evening which is super exciting um, and so getting to be a part of sort of that co-design process in a way that feels very authentic because it is youth for youth um, and I think yeah there's a real reciprocity in ACO that sort of exists in that space where yes in terms of like direction for where we're going to go as a group or as a company yeah you can look to Lola or you can look to Cassie or you can look to Ella but in terms of hey I really want to write a piece about this you can go to anyone and anyone will come to you and it's less hierarchical hierarchical it's very much very interwoven and everybody speaks to everyone um so I think it's yeah it's a very unique space to work in I don't think there's anything quite like it yeah, it's, it's pretty unique. And, you know, I've had the pleasure of meeting Lola in person as well, and um, which is pretty cool. And I think, you know, the cool things that you guys do is really, and the, what I like about it, it's very professional. You know, it's not a, it's not a slapjack, you know, it's just put together by, um, with, you know, paper and sellotape, essentially. It's actually a really professional um, production, which is really beautiful. You know, it, it just, it's, it, it speaks to the professionalism that you have with your content as well. Um, I'm going to put talk that aside and I'm going to come back to you. Um, the piece I'm going to talk about now is at the start, we spoke about the fact that you came to New Zealand when you're 18 months old. So Zimbabwe, apart from what people told you about it, was not part of your life, essentially, it, it, because not it was just, it was just, hey, this is in my my blood, maybe. But fast forward to 2023 and you you created a a board game. Yep. Yeah, called called in Ghana. What was the inspiration behind that? Because the reason I ask the question is because um, no real association with Zimbabwe apart from your family. But now you've used that to go. Wait a minute, I actually want to tell some. Use that to bring that back. What is that like for you? And I guess how does your your parents' influence and your family's influence dictate that? Um, for me, when I thought of Ngano initially, I sort of thought back about different business ideas, and I thought about what. Is Zoe actually good at? I think I always describe myself as I have a very high about I have very high esteem, but I think that means I push myself to do a bit more. So I generally like I think I'm very good at some things, but I don't think I'm very good at everything. So I think I had to. I was like, oh, I could do something in food, but I was like, I'm not a very good cook, <laughs> and I don't think I'm. I don't think I'd be the most sanitary chef to be mass producing food. And I was like, I just sort of thought back to something that had always been a reoccurring feature in my life which had always been storytelling it was something that I could always fall back on I like distinctly remember when I was planning out the business thinking back to being in like year five or year six and I had to do a quick assignment I I do have a tendency to leave things to the last minute and I just immediately 
thought back to a story that my grandmother had told me and I was able to recite it and I drew pictures and I was able to sort of make that story come alive as well as doing my speech and drama there's different units and modules where you need to be able to tell stories and I think I actually did use the story that I based my that I was initially going to base my board game on in an exam um, and it was something that sort of was so foundational, intrinsic to who I am, that I could always sort of come back to. Um, in 2015 to 2016, my grandmother came to New Zealand when my little brother was born. Um, so in that time, I think she she did come back. She did come to New Zealand in like 2011, 2012, which is probably when I initially remember those stories being told. Um, but I think it was when she came that second time when those stories really cemented themselves as, as sort of something that was a reference point to me of my own culture. Great. And I guess, you know, so what is that like, you know, so now you're hearing these stories. Um, actually, you, you've referenced a few times that um, speech and drama is, is your jam, essentially. Is that something that's been naturally, um, something that, you, that you've come across naturally, or has it been something that you've learned and decided that you love this and you're going to go down this pathway? Um, I think there's a level of my public speaking that's probably innate. I think I've always been described as being like absurdly confident and I would sign up for every single talent show. And I, one thing that was quite notable about me that I think pretty much still rings true is I don't very much, I don't tend to get nervous, like particularly before presenting something. I think I sort of have this sureness throughout most things that I, that things are going to be okay or that I'm going to do okay, which turns out to be quite dangerous when it comes to sports because I'm not very coordinated but I generally <laughs> like no I'm gonna be fine it's gonna be okay everything's gonna I was like just like every little thing's gonna be all right so I think my public speaking there's an innate level of confidence that was always there but I think speech and drama allowed me to refine and to specifically understand how to deliver something in a way that makes the other person receive it how the idea makes sense in my head I think that's the very difficult thing for a lot of people when it comes to speaking is they know exactly how they feel or they know um, the idea that they want to communicate but they struggle with how to communicate it in a way that makes sense to another person but specifically thinking about targeted audiences it's like um, how would you explain we are conjectures to a four-year-old most people don't have the capacity to do that and then you could have the most um, robust understanding, in-depth understanding of, of, you know, advanced mathematics. But if you don't understand the needs of this four-year-old and what reference points make sense for them for you to be able to explain it, you're never going to be able to communicate those ideas across. So I think speech and drama was sort of like, it helped me hone and refine a lot of what was already there. But, and that, I love that because you speak about the, you, it's, it's, what a lot of us don't do is we don't get our innate passions, innate strengths, and use them and leverage them in all aspects of our life. Even though if it means that, hey, you get into the sports field and go, oops, oops, but hey, it helps you get out there and you learn about yourself as, as a person, which is which is great. And I guess, you know, I guess that lends itself really well to storytelling. Um, but again, I guess my question for you now is, what was it like for you to introduce Ngano to a New Zealand society? And there isn't the my context of this question is we live in a super diverse um, community, as I said before, but you know we have we live in a community where we 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 have Maori culture, we have Pacific culture, we have a, we have we have every culture underneath the sun essentially. And now you're bringing in a different story from a different culture. And why I ask that question is coming from Zimbabwe. We know that there is a whole actually rephrase that Africa is. You know, you're not just from Africa. You are from a certain part of Africa. You're not from Zimbabwe. You're from you are from Shona. You're 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 Mashona, right? And I'm in Dibele. Very different, right? So you go right. Cool. How was that like? You taking that small part of Africa, Zimbabwe, and bring it into a story in New Zealand, where there's so many other cultures that are amazing. I think for me, with telling Zimbabwean stories, it felt particularly more authentic. But I think engaging with Zimbabwean stories in the business context was something that I personally struggled with because I think the whole I guess with the young enterprise process it's sort of like how you would naturally you pitch a business and then there's all these processes that you have to go through but I think it was difficult for me to continually sort of feel like I'm having to prove the worth of these stories yeah. um, and I think the New Zealand market I think with 
the value that we place that we place on Taonga um, and culture and the relevance of culture and Masaranga Māori and Kōpaka Māori throughout everything means that you don't know so much have to prove the value of stories or storytelling but you have to prove the value of the story that you're trying to tell That's right. um, and so with how I design Gano I first of all I was like okay this is going to be an educational tool so how am I going to make this educationally valuable because I could present it as that oh they're learning about a culture like a different culture through the story but I was like that's that only takes you so far so I think to the benefit and detriment of Gano, I think I try to put as many layers on there to sort of, I think everything I did in terms of the design of it was to prove like, hey, this is valuable. Hey, this is valuable. So I, I was, okay, information about the animals that feature in the story. And then it was about ethics. And so how do you, the the general story of um, the first one that I did, which was the boy and the snake, where the, there's a boy, there's a snake, the snake is trapped under a rock, the boy saves the snake from the rock, and then the snake tries to bite him, and then the, the boy's like, wait a minute, let's check with the other animals to see what they think about this, and in the original story, every single animal says yes, and so the frame from which I sort of took it each, sorry, the f- I tried to put the kids in the perspective of each animal, so whether that be through games and activities, or exercises where it was like they get to discuss or they get to act out being the animals or they act out the story as though they were the animals or they use the boards to tell the story um it was about the ethics and what do you think informs these perspectives so it was from the perspective of the hares hares are xyz big uh they live in this sort of dynamic why how do you think this influences the way that they view the situation hare are prey how do you think that that dynamic between you know, being a prey and predator, how do you think that influences why they think it was okay for the snake to bite the boy? Do they, and then from the perspective of the flamingos and the lion, and so from their individual position in the animal kingdom and how they interact with each other, how do you think that influences their perspective of um, this scenario? Um, And so I think I I went out of my way to put a lot of added details to prove the educational value, which I think probably if I'd felt more security in the inherent value of storytelling at the time, I would have just done it as it was. But I think I spent put a lot of pressure on myself to keep adding layers to make it like, first of all, scalable, but then also, oh, I need to have all of these extra features to make it valuable. Because I think it was $45 per um, box. And I was just like, I felt a lot of pressure to really, really emphasize the value of it when I don't think that was something that was 100% necessary. And that's so hard, right? That's so hard. You know, we live in a world where, um, the, where as soon as you put anything that's got a monetary value to it, you need to justify, you feel like you have to justify what someone is spending their money. And this is something that I learned as well when, in my in my, in my my business that I run. Um, it's a coaching business. And at the start, I was like, I can't charge somebody X, Y, Z dollars because I'm not giving them value. So I undercharge. And then someone once said to me, hey, if you don't value yourself, no one is going to value you. And the value that, so the value you put into the stories alone is the value that you have for the stories. Whereas if you go, I need to justify the stories, then you're devaluing the actual story. But it's not your fault. It's because the perception of society is that we have to value things up, which is pretty crazy. But it's normal. It's normal. Um, so pretty awesome. That, that would have been a great experience for you doing that, um, going to Young Enterprise and giving that a bit of a crack. Um, one, of the, one of the things I noticed when I was um, doing my research about you is that um, one of the words that, desc- that, that's that been used to describe you is that you are a fierce advocate for your community. What does that mean? What is how, how, what does that actually mean? Because community is massive. Is there a specific community that you, is it, is it Johnsonville? Is that, um, what is what is your community? What is it everything? Um, I think for me, that's one of those things that baffles me a little bit as well. I think in the way that I think I could be characterized as a fierce advocate is I'm very adamant about pushing through experiences and even if I have to be the first black girl to do it or the first girl to do it or the first black person period or the first immigrant to do it I will do it and I will make it easier for those that come behind me to go through that same pathway as well Um, so I was the first black kid to attend my primary school and then all my little cousins came and then their friends came and then my other friends who were black their cousins came to that school as well and their experience was very different to my experience but I was able I I think it's very tricky because I I don't want to have this very high estimation of the of the you know 
the difference that eight-year-old Zoe made in that community. But I think being able to sort of push through the discomfort of being the first person to enter a space. Um, there was a very long time in my life where pretty consistently I was the first Black person that anybody had ever met. Um, and obviously I spoke about it in my TED Talk, how those sort of interactions then became that people didn't perceive me as being the same as other or what they think Black people are supposed to be like. But I think whether I chose to or not, in a lot of situations, I was people's exposure therapy to that sort of difference. Um, and I think for the most part, I just try to bring people through with me. So when I do things, I don't like to do things alone. And I like to make things easier for all of those intersections that I lie in. So whether that's, I get this really cool opportunity or I see this really cool opportunity, I don't think that there's anything I've ever done that I haven't brought someone along with me um, or I've done it and I've said this is a really cool opportunity um, particularly for girls I think that's probably my biggest area of which I'm very adamant about bringing people through has been for girls I think particularly coming from a girls school um, it's always been I've always been very adamant about helping equip young girls with the you know the vocabulary or the speaking capacity to be able to communicate the ideas that they have that was my big thing when I was the board of trustees representative at my school was that a lot of people I think a lot of people assume that people that speak in a certain way are particularly unintelligent I know for myself I've definitely changed the way that I've spoken to be a lot more approachable um, in terms of sort of changing the, the slang that I use. I never really used to say like like or um or and, but I realized that people felt that I didn't understand them because I spoke differently to them. So I've definitely changed the way that I've spoken over time. Um, but being in that school, I think I like went to a particularly posh school. I think a lot of girls that didn't necessarily speak in the way that people think that somebody that goes to that school could speak, should speak, they didn't feel like their ideas or their voices were being heard. So for me, um, I've never been particularly interested in speaking for people. Um, I think it's probably just as easy for me to say your idea as it would be for you to say your idea. But I think if, the, if I'm not passionate about it, why should I speak about it? And if it's not something that's important to me, I mean, it will be important to me that it's important to you, but why wouldn't you go directly to the source? So for me, it's been about platforming people it's been about helping bring people up and if they want me to edit their submission I'll help them edit their submission if they want me to be the person that introduces them and brings them into the space I can be that person that brings them into that space but for me it's always been about platforming where I can but if there's instances in which I have to where I'm having to speak for someone it's doing that in the most authentic way that I can um, last year, I was part of the Strengthening Democracy project um, run by Peter Cullen, uh, where different high schoolers were brought in. Um, we got to, at the end of the day, we got to speak to the then Prime Minister, Chris Hipkins, the Chief Justice, and the Speaker of the House at the time. Um, and for me, I went through and I just interviewed every single person in my year 13 cohort. And even though I didn't end up using a lot of the stuff I used, like I asked them, obviously, like their thoughts on democracy and if they, a lot of them didn't know how to define democracy. And I think a lot of people would have stopped there and just sort of assumed that these people don't understand what democracy is. But just because somebody doesn't have the vocabulary to articulate their thoughts doesn't mean there's a lack of understanding. But as much as that was important, I also asked them about their dreams. Um, I asked them about, you know, what they would do if the, the world was better, what they think they could do to make the world better. Um, I asked them about if they were voting a lot of those people were 17 18 uh, or turning 18 at that time in time for the election and I asked them if they were voting or why weren't they voting and sort of the most resounding thing was is that although these girls are on paper incredibly privileged they go to a very good school they have very supportive families and supportive parents that um, are financing their education and everything sort of seems on paper to be perfect with them they felt deeply disempowered and not disempowered angry, but disempowered so settled in that feeling of disempowerment that they never even thought that they should vote because why does their vote matter? And I think there's always sort of this perspective, particularly looking um, with, at this sort of age when you're comparing yourself to other people where there's definitely a dozen other people which is like, oh, I, I shouldn't vote, my vote doesn't matter, but her vote probably does. But if these people that are supposed to sort of be in that upper echelon and that top, um, five ten percent of society if they don't feel like their vote matters whose vote matters at all um so i think then that 
perspective was then what I was able to bring into that space so that although there's general youth disengagement I think there's a large element of that you know you're treating these 18 17 16 18 year old girls like they're children but they're also being empowered with this opportunity to vote and they're stuck in this sort of liminal space where they're not quite adults and they don't feel like they know enough um, to be allowed to vote but I think that there's an inherent female perspective on democracy because when you think about women's issues women's issues aren't just reproductive rights women's issues are the economy women's issues are democracy their um cost of living they're everything because women are people that exist in our society so i think probably most recently it's been about bringing the people that i know and that i experience and sort of knowing lots of people and knowing people intimately and being able to bring those perspectives and those ideas into the spaces that i go into I yeah, like I think it's probably been that fierceness that people feel. Yeah. Well, it's important because you know the fierceness people see that, but then I think what I what I what I love about your answer there was the fact that it's not it's not about you alone. It's about platforming others. And why why I find that really fascinating is because um some people um are afraid to do stuff because they think their thought is not valid. They they, they are validated. But when they see someone like yourself who's actually wait a minute, this is a valid opinion and a valid thought, but and they have the support of you to say whether it's the submission or whether it's just, you know, getting, hey, how do I actually say this much better? And that helps people. Whereas if we take the big converse and go, it's just all about you, then clear the clear demarcation. All right, cool. Hey, Zoe's just doing this for herself. What about the rest of us? And that's when you cause cause lots of prom- problems. So problems in society really. Um and I guess, you know, what's what's really what's really beautiful about what you've just shared is the fact that it's not um it's not just one particular matter. It is it is a a a demographic that you're really passionate about, but not just about that. It's about what the impact of that is on on society as, as a whole, which is which is, you know, if you make one change in one one demographic, then things change. And I'll tell you a funny story, Zoe. When I did my first PhD submission, my PhD submission, my initial PhD submission was to I coming from Africa, I see I I see the power or the disempowerment of of females. And um so my when I did my PhD a long time ago, my my PhD submission was I wanted to go back to Zimbabwe and I wanted to empower um, a village of of women um, with cell phones because at that point in time there were laptops, but I said no laptop. My argument was laptops. People, if a male sees that they're going to take it and sell it, you know, I just know what Africa is like and it's going to disappear. And I was like, but if we empower them with the cell phone, if we empower one or two females in a village with a cell phone, we're empowering the whole village, and. My submission was denied because they're like, no, this doesn't. This is a long time ago. They're like, no, this is silly. This doesn't happen because they don't understand the context of what happens in not just Africa, but in many, many um, patriarchal, patriarchal societies where where the males dominate how females get information. And you know, my mom is a doctor, and my mom would always say to me when she sees patients, she goes, "Man, if only they knew." X, Y, Z, then this wouldn't happen. Um, you know, especially in Zimbabwe, as you know, the crazy epidemic with HIV is just rampant, but it's not, it's rampant because of, of miseducation and misinformation. And so I was trying to say, hey, if we just have a cell phone, give it to, even if it's two females in a village, straight away, the females are empowered, but so are the young people. And that makes a massive change. Um, so, which is why, you know, when I spoke to you at the start and said there's things that resonate, it's not just the fact from Africa, but it's also the passion that we have for empowering, as you said, females, because female empowerment is, it's, I mean, all across the world is important, but in some parts of the world, it's even more important because the ripple effect is ridiculously crazy. Um, not saying there's good or bad, it's just the impact, double impact is pretty, pretty, pretty ridiculous. Um yeah, sorry, I was trying to tangent there, but I just wanted to share share how I just vibe with you in that in that context there. And talking about talking about other cool things, um, you know, I'm I'm speaking to you because I think you do some really cool things. What is it like for you, um, recently being nominated on the on the white 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 oh, I got it on this the white twenty five? That um, uh, everyone asks how it was. I think there is nothing quite like it. I think it's one of the most enveloping. Ex- experiences I think I have had and probably will ever have it's it's an environment and a space in which you're surrounded with so much love and care not entirely just for the work that you do but for the person that you are Um, I think it was super cool to be around so many people doing so many interesting things I think they always talk about it and we have so many Y25 um, um, alumni coming through and everyone talks about imposter syndrome and say how could you feel imposter syndrome compared to me but then I think 
everyone feels that. Um, I, yeah, I think, but it's definitely one of those places that there's nothing quite like it. And it's not so much the physical location of where you went, but it was the people that you brought with you. Um, so I think, yeah, anywhere you are where, well, I guess anywhere I am with the Y25, especially the 2024 cohort, um, is always going to feel like home. I think it's it's a beautiful environment um, and it's a beautiful group of people doing such amazing work. For those who know nothing about that, do you want to explain what Y25 is? You know, I know what it is about, but for our listeners, they yeah. might not know what that is. Um, the Y25 is a group of 25. This year was 26. Um, young Wahine and Tahine from across New Zealand that are sort of selected together um, and we're sort of put through this program across the span of six months. It sort of highlights the stuff that we're already doing, but then sort of brings us together, helps us network, helps us give us the skill to continue with the work that we're already doing. Um, and we're, we recently just had our launch on the 16th of August um, up in Auckland. Um, and it was, yeah, so it's just a really, really great program that you can, I definitely nominate any young person you know to go for it. Um, I think you just have to be under 25. Um, but yeah, it's run by the YWCA up in Auckland. Um, but yeah, there's lots of different meetings that you have between the people that you work with and you get to know everyone quite well. And it's just a very, um, it's a community that you get to be a part of, not only of the 24 other people that you're with, but also with the people that have sort of come before you through that program. And that's very, very cool. So obviously someone nominated you and you well, which is really cool. Um, yeah, well done. Well done. I'm not, not surprised though. But what's cool for me is it's um, given me some ideas of people I can also nominate because there's some amazing young people out there, but they're not aware of these these amazing opportunities, which is which is beautiful. So I'm just going to switch focus just a little bit. We've spoken about how, how amazing you are as a young person, but let's talk about the reality of how this whole journey has been. I mean, we've spoken about how everything's been amazing, but what are some of those challenges that you've had as a young as a young person, not growing up, but as a, just as a young person, being a young person and having all these cool things happening, plus growing up, going through what a young person goes through? I think I figured out where I was. Um, but yeah, I've always been very, very sure that I was, you know, fantastic. And I definitely at times had an inaccurate perception of how cool I was. I think there was definitely a point in my early childhood where I thought it was a lot cooler than I was. I was one of those kids that was like a really, really bad snitch to the point that the teachers told me to stop snitching because it was just like, <laughs> we don't really care about the things he's telling us about and she's not making any friends doing it. Um, so I think I, when I was younger, I think I was mostly characterized by the very, very strong sense of justice that I had. I was like, no crime went unpunished when Zoe was around. I would tell on anyone for anything to the point that if people were doing something bad, I would just look at them. And I think I specifically remember these boys were playing basketball inside. And I just like looked at them just out of curiosity, like, what are they doing? And they immediately stopped what they were doing, came over to me, apologized, and then put the ball back. <laughs> and so I think when I was younger, I was very much characterized by that very unwavering um, sense of justice that I had um, and sort of becoming older um I didn't always speak the way that I do now I spoke in a very calculated and probably at the time it did probably come across quite inauthentic I remember being in year seven and I think I almost hit someone with my book bag and they said oh you almost hit me I said well that's highly unlikely and I think not so much that that was an inaccurate way to describe what was going on or what I was thinking or what I wanted to communicate but I don't necessarily think it was made the most sense for an 11 year old, 10, 11 year old to say. And I remember immediately that person coming back, like, why do you talk like that? Why do you do this? And sort of, there was a few people at that stage in my life that sort of questioned every single thing that I did. And I was like, why do you dress like that? Why do you do this? And it, it was, I think, and I think they came and spoke to me about it. I think a lot of people when I was younger found that confidence quite confronting and took that as something that needed to be broken down and so I think getting into that 13 to 16 stage of sort of not really like facing obviously a lot of racism but obviously feeling quite unsure about myself and the things that I did that wasn't something that was internally generated I think that was something that was very much so external um and I think race did play a hand in that I think there was inherently something sort of confronting about somebody who seemingly doesn't belong that doesn't think they don't belong and then there's sort of a wanting to undermine that and I think there was a combination of genuine maliciousness and then things that were just sort of um just ignorance I think where I I was very much consistently told for a very long time oh you speak 
worked so well. And but it was always sort of from a perspective perspective of surprise. It's like, oh, you really you, you're a really good speaker. It's like they didn't expect me to be a very good speaker. And then it makes you think, why wouldn't they think I'm a very good speaker? Um, and so I think a lot of the insecurity in the person that I was and that sort of sense of tall poppy was very much something external placed upon me that I think I obviously still struggle with with to this day. I think as much as I am pretty sure that I'm pretty cool and I am able to talk about how I think I'm pretty cool, I think there is a natural awareness that I have that there are probably some people listening to this that thinks, wow, she's obnoxious. Um, And I think there's a level for me where it's sort of separating what is true and what isn't true um, and sort of picking what does and doesn't resonate. But I think there's always going to be that awareness now uh, sort of coming out of that time of my life and getting sort of back to being quite settled in the person that I am that, oh no, there is a chance that people are thinking X, Y, Z about me. Um, And personally, I'm not somebody that I'm not particularly combative, combative. I think if somebody says something bad about me, it's not in my nature to just sort of dismiss it. I have to, sort of do an inventory check and check in oh is this true about me does and figure out what resonates and what doesn't and I think that was probably the other thing that sort of came out of that phase of for the first time I don't think it was so much that people were intensively really picking on me I think it was just a transition into an environment where that's just something that happens I think most eight-year-olds aren't very aware of anything other than themselves and whether their nose is running and I think moving into a high school environment at like the age of 10, 11, I, my high school started at year seven. I think that's just something inherent to the space. I don't think, oh, there were obviously some elements of it that were racially charged, but I think it's when it's just the way that 12, 13 year olds are. And I think for me, that was particularly difficult being somebody that, that I have to let things sink in. And I think I sort of think of myself like a sponge. Like if it's really, really rubbish, it will just kind of ping off the side. But if I feel like there's any element of truth in it, it does really sink in for me. So I think a lot of those things did really sink in for me. And it's something that I'm still sort of working through where it sort of, yes, it definitely exists for me that, okay, there are probably some people thinking that. Zoe sounds pretty obnoxious right now. And so I'm even presently sort of going through that process of like, okay, does that resonate? Does that make sense? Does that align with who I am and who, with how I view myself? Which I think is an important thing for any young person to do, um, sort of picking up what resonates and getting rid of what doesn't. But I think that definitely has made it harder for me, especially with things like um, like negative criticism or taking in feedback, especially when the feedback is accurate. Um, I think, yeah, if it was something that was somebody who's like, Zoe, your hair is orange. Well, my hair isn't orange and I, I'm not going to believe you when you say that. But if it was something that, you know, it does touch on something that I'm aware that I'm probably not performing as well on or something that I am cognizant might be coming off a certain way, it is important for me to take those things in. So I think that's probably my biggest thing as a young person is, yeah, picking out what does and doesn't resonate with me. And that's so that's so hard because we're all humans, right? We're all humans, and this at some stage things are gonna, like you said, things are gonna, things that should bounce off normally just go in because they cut deep, and things that shouldn't cut deep bounce should cut deep bounce off, and it's just it's just it's awareness. But as you said, and I, I love what you said there, it's not just about sometimes it's the stage of life when you are eight years old, eight year old Zoe is going to be affected by eight year old Zoe, no matter what your race is, what gender you are in, as you're eight year old, this is what's going to happen. Versus someone who say an 18 year old where those things that were your eight year old you wouldn't think about, but now you go, wait a minute, I'm going to think about that there. So that's really, really beautiful. Um, Zoe, there's so much you've shared today and I'm sure you've got so much that you could share, but we've been speaking for almost an hour now with dodgy internet. So I really apologize for that there. Um, but uh, um, I want to wrap up the podcast with with a question that we love to ask our guests. Our podcast is called Boss of Knowledge and we invite all of our guests to share a piece of knowledge to put into our kitty or our basket. So for myself, for Tane, who's not here today, and for our listeners, anything from any aspect of your life, you've shared so much today, but is there anything that you, that you live your life by or you go, hey, this is pretty cool for me to share? Um, I think obviously from the very short and sweet, why not? Like, why, why yeah. are you going to do that? Why not? Why wouldn't you do it? Um, is probably in terms of sort of believing in yourself. It's like, if you don't, believe in yourself enough to try who's going to believe in you um 
I think people have a lot more capacity to do things than they believe they do that, that they do. Um, and I think it's important to obviously know your limitations, but also to be willing to push yourself because every single time that you push yourself, it's like stretching. Obviously, you should never try to do the splits on day one. But every single time that you stretch yourself, you give yourself the capacity to go further the next time. Um, I think generally, I think it's self-preservational. I think people generally steer away, steer away from difficult things or uncomfortable things. But every single time that you do something difficult or that pushes you or that challenges you, you just increase your capacity to do that again. Because your brain's elastic. I think, yeah, you're constantly expanding and stretching and don't ever let yourself stagnate because you don't believe that you can do it. Because if you don't believe that you can do it, who's going to believe that you can do it? And that, that is that is so, so true. You know, um, yeah, when, when people ask me why, it's like, why not? And yeah. you get stumped. Oh, oh, why not? Oh, oh, I don't know why. So um, it's really beautiful. So what I've learned from your piece of knowledge is I should start doing the splits, essentially. Yeah. Essentially, I'm right? trying to regain my splits. I used to be a cheerleader and I think I went to go touch my toes the other day. I was like, oh, that doesn't feel like it used to. Oh, oh yeah. don't ask me about how I touch my toes because I can't, but that's okay. That'll be my <laughs> my next learning from tomorrow. So any any last words for our listeners about, about you or about any aspect of your life that you're really passionate about that you would like to share before we, we round up? Because, um, you know, we've touched on only the tip of the tip of the iceberg about your story and there's some things that maybe you would just want to use this platform to talk about if you if you like um i'll probably do like an identities recap so sort of addressing people from different perspectives um as a daughter um i think it's super important to recognize your children as people as whole separate people outside of yourself and give them the space and the agency to be their own person um but also to let them get to know who you are as a person um, I think a lot of relationships get severed once you sort of start to treat each other as just like oh that's mom and she's always there or you're my kid you do what I want I think it's important to sort of acknowledge and respect um, your child or your parent as an individual person um, as a sister um, for probably for my little brother flush when you go to the toilet <laughs> um, as a friend I think it's oh, super important Oh my yeah, God. poor oh Michael. My. He's getting flamed a little bit. Bless yeah. him. I, I do love him a lot. I think he tried to come in earlier and I said, I think I should sort of shoo him away with my eyes. Um, as a friend, not every single friendship in your life has to be the biggest or best one, but I don't think that devalues it. I think it's important to just have friends that you can go to the movies with or just have friends that you sit with in class. It doesn't make that friendship less valuable just because it's not all encompassing. Um, as an activist, well, I feel like I really don't feel like I should call myself an activist, but, but that's exactly what I was going to say is that I think you should believe in the impact that you can have. And I think even just having the strong intention to do something or to to make a change or to, like I said, bring people in with you, even if you can't physically bring them in with you, but bringing their perspectives into the discussions you have, that can make you a change maker. Um, and probably lastly, as Zoe, uh, wealth is health, invest in your health, but fitness and health isn't always necessarily about being thin it's about being able to preserve your mobility for longer and doing things that you enjoy and that bring you happiness yeah that's probably you know my five little bits from the five bits of me i love that i love that because you know each one of us is individuals but each one of us is also an individual in context of different different perspectives which is really beautiful and we forget about that right we totally forget about that because we just think me is me versus me versus different context so um thank you so much for jumping on today um i've thank learned so much you. about you as a person but also about things that i have to reframe in my brain to think about stuff so that's really beautiful and i'm sure listeners out there would have have learned something if you haven't learned something go back and listen again because um you've been silly and not listening so listen again um but thank you so much Zoe, for jumping on um probably listeners out there thank you for jumping on feel free to share this comment like it and don't forget the most important thing over the next few weeks is to keep smiling and to put something into your past knowledge till next time kakite bye everybody thank you for listening to baskets of knowledge yeah we hope that you found something useful to put into your basket of knowledge and as we said before Remember to put something little into your baskets of knowledge every week. And as always, feel free to like, comment, and share this podcast. Thanks, everybody. Bye.